Congratulations on your purchase of the new HQ16 quilting machine. My name is Laurel Barris and I'm the president of the Handy Quilter Company. I'm also a certified machine quilting instructor. So I'll be able to help you quickly get started quilting so you'll have beautiful quilts in less time. We have here today our new table. It's an expandable table. It goes from five and a half feet to 11 feet. It also is adjustable vertically for any height. Um, set up just like any dining room table. It has different leaves that go on it to get any increment that you need between the five and a half and 11 feet. It's a sturdy table. Um, we also have some other frames that we have. There's a commercial table and also um, we have our other portable frames that collapse down quickly to be portable and take with you anywhere you go. Cabins, vacation, quilt guild meetings, wherever you need to take it. All right, let's get started with our our machine here. Um, hopefully you've already got your handles installed, the three screws on here. Be sure that they're cinched down tight so that there's no wiggle or wobble in the handles. And remember to turn on the machine in the back and when that machine turns on you have to wait just a minute for it to boot up and you'll know when it's booted up because the lights will come on. In setting up the front handles, the computer um, for the front handles runs the entire rest of the machine. So whatever you do here on the front happens to the back and the side of the machine. You can see on the readout here we have needle up, needle down, and by using the arrows we can move up and down and use the different functions on this LCD. So needle down, if I let the cursor go by needle down and I hit the select button, that means that every time I stop this machine the needle will always end needle down unless I push on my left hand button which says up and down and that will do a temporary override. So um, let's say I want to go needle, um, I can needle down, let's say I want to go needle up. So I can hit select. Now every time I stop the machine, it will always end needle up unless I do a left hand override. Let's go down to setting up the white light. Okay, the lights are on. If I push this button, the lights will go off. That gives you off and on function. Next, we have the setup. If I if I push select, it lets me decide um, what I want to have for my speed. And if you'll notice, when I turned the machine on, it was at 10. And that's a very slow speed. So every time I turn my quilter on, I don't want to have to ramp up to my favorite speed. This will automatically, every time I turn the machine on, start out at the speed I choose. So let's select my speed. and. It's at 10, so let's hold the button down until it gets up to my favorite speed. And I think I'll set this at probably about 50 or 60, probably 60. That's what I like to start out. 960, okay, there it is. Now I have to push select, and that speed is now permanently into the machine unless I tell it different. Key speed, I can hit select. That tells me whenever I push the hold the buttons down on the keys, how fast the computer responds. So I'm going to always set that at high. High is a pretty good speed. It responds well. Now to get out of this menu, I have to go down to the exit, hit select, and now I'm out of the setup menu and I'm ready to go. It was simple and fast, and now every time I turn my machine on, it starts out at 60. Now let's thread the machine. There's a few things I like to do before I start. I like to make sure I've got a good quality thread on my machine and I also like to give it a, a pull and make sure it's got a good strong pop to it. If you have some older threads, they don't pop, they just separate and that's bad. Um, older threads have a tendency to thread rot. They can either dry rot or wet, wet rot. And some of the polyester threads have some problems when they're exposed to too much of the tube lights or sometimes the sunlights even cause them to have some problems. So I just check my thread. All right, let's put it through the top eyelet and then down to the other thread guide and then there's a three hole guide here and what this does is this creates drag on the thread and helps slow it down so it's not flipping around and getting out of control and sometimes when I, I don't put my thread through all three of these holes. If I've got a fragile thread or one that I need to sew a little bit slower with, sometimes I only put it through one of the holes or sometimes just two. You're going to have to play with your threads, 
see what the thickness of the thread is and see what it requires. You kind of have to play with that. But at least it gives you some adjustment in there to use a variety of threads. I also put it down through the, the next guide. And um, I keep my thumb right here and squeeze the thread down tight to the machine so it creates some tension because now I have to squeeze this thread between the two tension plates. And there's a disc in here, and you can put your finger in there, and you can make sure that that thread's in there if you're not sure. OK, so I pull it in there, and you can tell it's caught it. Bring it all the way back around, and there's a little wire right here. And this wire has to be caught with the thread. And you can see it moving now. So I've caught it. Now it goes underneath of this upside down, I call it an upside down L. And that helps give that tension a little bit more activity. Then, simply thread from the front to the back, from the back to the front, from the back of the machine to the front of the machine through that eyelet, and then down to the last um, guide that's on the machine. I've moved around to the front of the machine. I, I thread it through this last eyelet, and now right in this little sleeve that's just before it hits the needle area, I'm going to thread it through that, and then thread from the front to the back, and voila, I'm ready to quilt. Except for, we need to always make sure that that needle is a brand new needle every time we start quilting a quilt. Sharp needles leave hardly any, little, any holes in the, in, the, in the quilt top, and also a sharp needle makes it so you don't have any puncturing or torn fibers in your quilt. I'll show you how to change that needle. I'm going to change the needle on the machine by using the Allen wrench that came in your kit and loosen it just maybe like a half a turn and see if I can get that needle out. Don't want to loosen it too much. Okay, now it came out. It's okay to throw those in the garbage. Don't try to sharpen them. Some people like to do that and it does not work. Now let me tell you a little about this machine, you know, the needle for the machine. The, the front of the needle has a long straight groove and the back of the needle, you can see on this profile that there's a scooped out part right here, right in front of the eye of the needle. That scooped out part is called the scarf and that part has to go in the back. So let's rotate this back around and we have a long straight groove going to hold it so that that long straight groove is in the front. And I'm going to put the needle down in the needle hole and then push it back up into the shaft. And I'm going to make sure that's up as high as it will go. It has to be up as high as it will go so the timing will stay correct with the needle and the hook. Then I'm going to take a straight pin and you can decide where you want this to go. And it has to go at 6 o'clock. So I'm going to hold it right at 6 o'clock and tighten up my uh, screw. It doesn't have to be tightened up so tight that you can't get it undone. It just needs to have a gentle tension on it. Now I'll go ahead and re-thread my needle. And you're ready to go. With a brand new sharp needle that you've just placed in the machine, now we're ready to move further on down and check out the bobbin case area. All you need to do is just reach in and lift up the latch on the bobbin case, which is right here. You can just do that by braille. You don't need to climb underneath your machine. Just lift that up and it releases the whole bobbin case out of your machine. Now let's make sure that we have correct tension on this. And I'm just going to pull it and it will barely want to lift out of my hand. If I lay it down, it'll just lift itself up and pull. And that's the correct tension for this. Remember that your tension comes from this plate right here. And if you need to do any adjustments, this this little black screw right here. And you only want to turn out like an eighth of an inch or maybe two hairs at a time. It's very sensitive. Also, be sure that when you are threading the bobbin and doing any cleaning, that the bobbin plate stays here where it belongs, that the whole plate doesn't jump out of this hole and maybe jump over to the side of the bobbin case. And also check underneath the plate. Right in here, you can see sometimes there'll be a thread or a bobbin, there'll be thread or there'll be lint build up in this bobbin case and it will 
make it so that this plate won't be able to squeeze down tight like it's supposed to and get very loose tension on the bottom. Some of the threads are very linty and they have a lot of buildup and that's okay. Just be sure that you check for that. Um, I like to take uh, an old paint brush. You can use an old toll painting brush or a pastry brush. But every time I change my bobbin, I get in here and I clean this out. Make sure I don't have any extra loose threads in there. And I place my bobbin case in there. It's turning, the bobbin's turning clockwise. Put it inside the case. Put it in underneath the latch. And check my tension. Yep, it's good. And uh, trim off to about two inches. You, don't, you do not want to ever lift up this latch to put it back into the machine. Just put your thumb over the hole. Be sure that this opening is at the top. And by braille, you can feel that post in there. You kind of wiggle it. Push with your thumb. When you hear the click, you know that it's correctly inserted into your machine. Then I hang on to my top thread, and I push the needle up, needle down button on my left hand button selector. And here comes my bobbin thread ups. And I can feel there's nice tension on that. And this machine is ready to start quilting. I'm going to show you how to maintain the bobbin case. I like to put a drop, just one drop of oil, into the bobbin area every time I change my bobbin. So let's go in here, take the bobbin case out, just set it aside, and with my oiler, I just need to put one drop of oil down into this race area. You can see that drop of oil. And if there's any kind of uh, lint buildup in here, here'd be the time to do that. Probably want to brush the lint out first and then put the oil in if you have lint in there. Because what happens with lint is it absorbs all the oil and makes your machine start running dry. So be sure you keep that lint out of there. Once again, we're popping it, making sure the thread is free, ready to go. We're going to show you three basic ways to load a quilt on the quilting machine. We're going to do a pin method, then we're going to do a safety pin method, and then we're going to do a sew on, a basting a stitch to sew the quilt onto the leaders. Today I'm using the HQ Professional uh, portable frame and all of the Velcro has been applied to the poles and it's just the two front poles and then this top one there's no Velcro on this carrier roller. So I have uh, pre-pinned my quilt which I like to do. I either pre-pin or I machine based my quilts or I pin them and I put them on hangers so that they stay nice and flat and straight and there's no wrinkles. And when I start loading my quilt, all I have to do is take it off the hanger, straighten it out, and I have pre-pinned the back of my quilt to my leader. And if you'll notice, I have pinned very close to the edge. I pinned right into the stitching area of the leader where the, where the serger uh, enclosed the raw edges. And I always like to let a little bit of the back of my quilt show through so I make sure that I've got both layers. And now all I have to do is just load the quilt with the Velcro. This pinning can be done in the car, in front of the TV, whenever you're stuck somewhere that you ha have some sit down time. Now the reason I throw this over the back is so I can keep an eye on what's going on with this quilt. I also want to make sure that the back of the quilt um, the wrong side is looking up. So here I have seam allowances. I'm looking at the seam allowances. Also, I can check to see if there's any stray threads in here. I wouldn't want a black thread caught in here because I can't see this once I start quilting. So I'm going to check this and I'm going to start rolling. And I'm going to smooth out evenly and keep rolling. Keep checking my quilt. Make sure that it's not getting caught over here in my machine. And just be sure that I don't have any drag, because if I start getting drag on the quilt, it's going to start winding one side tighter than the other. Also, if you have a friend helping you and they start, you know, pulling it tighter than you do, you're going to have a difference of, of uh, how the 
quilt's rolling on, it's going to be tighter on one side than the other. See, I've got a black thread here. I'm going to take that off. Keep smoothing it out. And just keep watching it. When you have seams like this, there's a tendency for the bulk of the seam to start winding this a little bit more bulky right here so that the ends are starting to flute out to the side. So if you want, you can pull up on this to compensate for that extra bulk that's going to make it a little bit tighter so it wants to roll on a little bit flatter. If you can, you always want to try to get these seams running this direction on your roller. Eliminates that problem, but I didn't have that choice on this quilt because I'm just using scraps of fabric. Now you can see here how this is making a diagonal line because this is pulling it. So if I just pull that and offset it, it instantly relaxed that. And now when I roll this up, I can check my work and see that I have this uh, cut edge is exactly parallel to the roller and I roll it up the correct way. Now if you have um, more fabric hanging down one side than the other, you're going to have to unroll it and re-roll it. See what happens. See why you had so much drag on one end that created it, created a problem with it rolling up on one side more than the other. Okay, now we're going to do the top, and it's the same way. Throw the top over the take-up roller, and I have found center on my uh, quilt and my leader, so I know that they're exactly centered. And I have center on my leaders, and I have centers on my pole. And what I've done on this one is I have just started from one end to the other, because these leaders are exactly the same length as the Velcro on the pole. Now this set of leaders, um, the Velcro is on the top, so all I have to do is just turn it wrong with the right side of the Velcro against the pole. And the reason that happened is I don't pay any attention to what direction that Velcro is going because the Velcro doesn't care. It doesn't matter if it's Velcroing on this way or if it's Velcroing straight from the back of the leader. Okay, put that on. And once again, I'm going to make sure everything's straight. If I need to, I can run to the back and straighten that out. And I always like to make sure my latches are in position so that I roll these the right way because it makes it so that it will only roll one direction when those latches are engaged. So taking off loose threads. And I'm going to roll it up. I finished rolling up the top of my quilt. If you'll notice, the edges are all nice and parallel to the roller, and one side is not hanging down further than the other, and so that means that when I start quilting my quilt, this will remain square and straight. Today I'm just using a 100% cotton bat, and I've pre-cut it. I would suggest that you do not put your batting on a roller underneath of your machine or any other kind of a dispensing system because just the slight tension on that bat as it's rolling off the roller and into your quilt, stretches that bat and it spring loads your quilt so that when you get your quilt off, it will kind of actually be kind of sheared in. This bat has got to be relaxed. I've cut the bat about an inch or two bigger than the quilt top, as well as the back. The back is, has to be at least an inch bigger all the way around than your quilt top. And, um, that can also be trimmed off later, but you need to have enough room so that when the quilting starts and there's any shifting or shrinkage with the stitching, you'll have room for that quilt top to float. Okay, I've sandwiched my batting in, in between the back and the top of the quilt, and I'm going to roll this down so I can get a handle on the top of the quilt, and I want to grab the back of the quilt and the batting all at the same time. I'm going to release the latches and pull this all the way through, about four or five, six inches longer than it needs to be. Make sure everything's smoothed over that take-up roller. And I'll walk around the machine and start pinning from the back. And I like to pin from the back of the machine so I don't hurt my back. 
I want to stay standing straight up as long as I can. I'm in back of the machine now, and I have all three layers of my quilt draped over the take-up roller. There's two ways I can load the back. I can take the top of the quilt, the batting, and the back, and just have them all as a one big sandwich. I can grab a hold of my, my leader, which is under here, and be sure that that leader goes down and underneath that carrier roller and back up. And I can take all three of these layers. I'm making sure that I don't have the quilt pulled to one side or the other. I can see that it's visually straight and there's no diagonal wrinkles in here and it's taut and nice. So I can take all three of those layers and I can pin through the leader and then into the quilt and I can pin from this direction starting from the center out and notice I'm always pinning against the leader because what happens is when you go to unload this quilt the quilt's going to be pulled tight like this and you're going to be able to grab a hold of those pins. If you pin in here it's going to be really hard to pull the pins out. So no matter which roller you're pinning to you always want to pin with the pins against the leader and you're pinning very very close to this edge because what happens if you pin too far in and you get kind of haphazard with it then what happens is when you go to quilt you can only quilt to right there because you're pulling against that pin and here it is and I'll back it up and you've lost all this quilting space in here so be sure that they go right against that that edge so you're pinning from the center out Okay, that's the, that's the three-layer method. So I'm going to take these pins out and show you another method, which is the most preferred among machine quilters. I'm going to roll that quilt top up and get it out of the way. And I'm only going to pin the back of the quilt and the batting. And if you want to pre-pin this uh, while you're watching TV or whatever you're doing, you can pre-pin the back of the quilt to this leader. I don't usually do the batting. That's too much bulk to carry around with me and haul around the house. But um, that batting can just lay in here. It doesn't have to be pinned in. So I'm pinning against the, the leader once again and making sure that I've got the back. I always have that back peek up just a little bit above that edge so I can make sure I'm getting it caught. I'm also putting one pin after the other. I'm putting the head of the pin to the point of the next pin. That way there's no space in here. What happens if you leave spaces and you just put the pins every two or three inches all the way down this leader, you're going to get scallops in the back of your quilt. Because when you pull tension on the rollers, it's going to pull your fabric and you're going to have uneven quilt on the back. So. Be sure that these are pinned close together. I like to use these nice big corsage pins. They're nice and long and I don't have to use as many pins and they're sharp and they're easy to grab a hold of. So all the way. And notice I've started from the center out and I'm making sure that my quilt is remaining flat and nice, that my batting is smooth. I'm checking for any loose threads. And if you want to pin like every five or six inches and just get the quilt basted to the leader, you can do that. It's kind of a little bit faster method. And then you can go back later, get clear out here to the edge. Then you can go back and fill in with the rest of the pins that are head to point. There's no spaces between them. You can see here how close those pins are. I've pinned the back of the quilt and the binding to the leader. And the top of the quilt is just sitting there. It's not doing anything. We're not doing anything with that one yet. I'm going to roll this up until the pins come to the bottom of that carrier roller and I'm going to engage my latch. Then I'm going to tighten up the bottom.
and then I can pull the top here. Now, of course, you've left two or three inches or one or two inches, whatever, bigger on the back of your quilt than the top, so you've got plenty of room to float this quilt top. That's what it's called. It's called floating the top. So all you have to do is bring it up here and straighten it out. And then take the machine and machine baste right close to this outside edge. I go as close to that outside edge as I can so that when I do my binding, I don't have to unpick anything. The binding encloses that basting stitch. Now I'll show you another method for loading your quilt. This is my favorite. This one I've already, I've already done. It's, it's the sew based method. Um, this is my quilt back, and I have sewn the back to both leaders. So this is the take up roller leader, and this is the bottom roller over here. This is the leader that it goes to. But all I have to do on this is just simply sew right along that edge. Instead of pinning it, I just stitched right into that stitching area of the leader. I use the longest stitch that my machine has. And also another tip is I put a really fine, uh, weak thread in my bobbin, uh, maybe a machine embroidery thread that's a real fine one. And then in my top, I put the strongest thread I can find that way, when I'm ready to take this quilt off of the leader, all I have to do is pull that top thread and pull it, and the whole thing pops undone. I don't have to unpick anything. It's just like I'm doing a zipper. It just rips out. So that method works. You can do, okay, like I said, both, both of the leaders, this is the back of my quilt, and then I also baste it to the top of my quilt. I only, um, I only baste to the top roller, and then I always like to float the edge like I did on this one. Uh, when I load it onto the quilter. Now the other method that's kind of a fun one, I like to use this one on littler pieces, but um, you can take your quilt and pin baste the whole quilt just with safety pins. And be sure that your back's pulled tight and that everything's smoothed out. <clears throat> and then you put a few safety pins, like every 12 or 15 inches. You don't need to put as many safety pins in this method as you do when you're sitting down at your sewing machine pushing the quilt through. This just needs to have enough on here to stabilize it. Um, even if you use the spray adhesives, you still need to put a, a few safety pins in there just to keep the layers from peeling apart. And of course the back is longer than the, than the top of the quilt, so all you have to do is take the quilt and Velcro it onto two rollers, the take-up roller, and you can choose which of these other two rollers you want. All you need is just the two, two rollers because the backing and the back racking is one, one layer. So that's another fast way to get your quilts on. There's no right or wrong way to load the quilts on the, on the quilter. It's totally up to you. But with our fast Velcro system, you have more choices of how to load your quilt. You don't have to stand, stand up to do any of, your, any of your loading of the quilt. And you can get quilting sooner. I've given you three different methods on loading your quilt. Uh, the first one, we totally pinned the quilt to the leaders. And this, the, the next method we used was stitching it with a basting stitch on your sewing machine. And the other method that we taught you was basting the quilt together with safety pins. And then you can either machine baste it or, or pin it to the leaders, whichever method you like the best. This gives you lots of flexibility. You can load these quilts anytime and anywhere you want so that when you're ready to start quilting, all you have to do is just Velcro them to the poles and you're ready to go. You'll have lots more time 
to do your quilts with a machine. If you're a first time user for machine quilting, I would suggest that you put a piece of muslin on the quilter and kind of play with the machine and get familiar with it. There's no way I'd put a nice piece quilt on for my first project. Uh, you might even want to try putting a cheater quilt, you know, those pre-printed baby quilts or something like that, anything, but don't put your nice best quilt on here to start out with. Okay, I'm just going to be using this piece of muslin and give you some basic techniques with it. One thing I like to do that saves me some time is when it's time to change thread, I just cut it back here, back of the machine, and I load the other piece on, the other uh, cone of thread, I tie an overhand knot, doesn't matter what knot it is, it's just the fast one for me. I take the needle out of the, take the thread out of the needle, and I just pull it through. The tension disc that kind of slows and bogs, I just put my fingernail in there, pull it through, and all the knots are through, and I'm ready to thread my needle and walk around the other side of the machine, start my quilt. Once again, I've got a brand new needle in here. I have my practice piece all set up and ready to go. A few things you need to remember. These side clamps need to go with the Velcro coming off of the bottom of the clamp. If you have the Velcro on the top and you've hooked it on like this, what's going to happen, this will hang down, will catch on the wheels of your carriage or on the carriage itself and cause some problems. So, and the other thing you need to remember <clears throat> is that this doesn't need to be pulled so tight that it's actually scalloping the edges of your quilt. You just want to have gentle tension on the side. And I prefer, if I have enough space, which we all remember we should have a bigger back than the top on our quilt, I like to just pin or um, clamp to just the back of the quilt and let that top float. And I come down the sides and I'll base that edge down to stabilize it and keep it flat. But for practice pieces, I don't go to all that trouble. Um, I just clamp both layers, uh, the top and the back, and the batting all together, and I go for it. So let's just see what the tension's like on this. If this was a real quilt, and which I do this on every single quilt, I don't just start quilting. I come off to the edge, even if it's just batting out here, and I do a little bit of a, a test to see what that batting is doing. I start quilting outside in the outside edge of the batting in the back, whatever's out here, and I just run the machine, I turn over the edge, and I check that my tensions are what I want them to be, and these look really good, they're very well balanced. Right here is a thread nest because I didn't hold my threads when I started, and I'll be showing you how to do that. But this has got a good tension. Now I'm just sewing on the batting, so that's probably not a real good indication, but at least I know there's not huge loops or any breakage or any other problems, so um, you can also try sewing down the edge. So I've got all three layers together here. I'm going to turn over and check it. Yep, I've got good stitch. Before you begin stitching, you need to lock your stitches, and there's a couple of ways to do that. Uh, you can go needle down and then needle up push the machine away, hanging onto this thread, and that automatically brings up your bobbin thread. So you can either uh, push the needle up, needle down button, and get a few stitches in there, and end with needle down, take your scissors, trim close, and then you can start quilting. Now when it comes time to stop, you can do the same thing. You can go needle down and needle up, and you don't want to go down in the exact same hole. You want to go a couple of threads away, back and forth, and lock that stitch in. You don't ever want to dance up and down in the same spot. All that does is create a knot. And then when you come back here to trim, you cut the knot off, and then your threads pop undone. So it's not a good way to do it. OK, now the plan B here, the next method, is go needle down, needle up, push the machine away to create that slack. Whoops, I lost my bobbin. Um, get in there. Okay. 
then hang on. And what I'm going to do now is a faster version of what I did over here. I'm going to start the machine out slow so that I get little tiny micro stitches, and then I'm going to move the machine at my regular speed. So I'm going to do a couple of pulse stitches. And then when I stop the machine, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll pull the machine away, needle down, needle up, push the machine away, bring up the bobbin, and trim close to the edge, close to the top of the quilt. So both methods do the exact same thing. It's just that the second method is a little bit faster. And it takes a little bit of practice to just uh, start that machine, uh, push it away, grab the bobbin, and then slowly start out. But if you've ever tried unpicking those micro stitches, you know they're never going to come out. So um, they're a very secure stitch and they don't leave any thread tails. I'm going to show you some different ways to mark your quilt. Of course, the most preferable way to do quilting is freeform, and that's where you just either follow an existing design on your quilt and you put in your own interpretation of that design. But for those areas where you need to mark, I'll show you some fun ways to, to do that. Uh, there's a lot of pre-made stencils on the market. There's also some pounce, uh, pounce pads. This one you kind of have to pound a little bit and on the inside of it. This is where all the powder comes out. You take out this red plastic lid and fill it with the powder and it just comes out of this terry cloth base. So uh, I've got the, the uh, powder worked into my terry cloth. All I have to do is just rub it across the stencil. Pull the stencil away, and there's my design. Looks like I will go like extra out there. This blue is probably one of the hardest things to get out of your quilt, so be sure that you pre-test before you mark it. Otherwise, sometimes those marks stay in there permanently. But then all you have to do is line up your machine, and you remember your machine always sews best from left to right, and you'll have the least amount of problems. And We'll do the method where we're going to do one stitch at a time here. And okay, now we'll do the quilting. You can see on this quilt that um, most of that blue bounced away by the time I got to the to the end. As you noticed on the other design that I did, the chalk had a tendency to bounce away be almost before I got finished with it. So I'm going to show you a really fun trick to keep that chalk in place. Okay, I'm chalking another line. And there's a new product out called Press and Seal. And you just get it at the grocery store. But it's really neat because it's got the same sticky back to this plastic as I think it's the same stuff like what they use on sticky notes. Feels just like it. Anyway, you take this and stick it over the top of your chalk. And you can start doing, you can chalk all the way down your quilt. And as you get to the areas that you need to quilt, you can peel this off and your chalk will stay stay put and it won't vibrate loose from working on the other areas of your quilt. Now another thing that's really fun to do with the, the press and seal is this eliminates the need to use uh, vellum or any of the other tracing papers. You have your design, you put it underneath of the press and seal and be sure you use a water erase pen, or you can use the water erase markers like what you use for kids. But you just trace the whole design on here. After you're finished tracing, peel the paper away. And 
stick this down in the middle of your block or whatever it is you want to do the quilting on. And it stays put because it's got sticky on it. Now, I'm ready to just pop this away. It just pops right off. You don't have to get any tweezers out to pull the extra plastic out like you do with the paper. This is clear and it doesn't even show anything that's left behind. Now, if there's any of the, um, the ink that's transferred through, which it will, into your quilt, it's all water uh, soluble. It'll come right out. You don't have to worry about any permanent marks. So do not ever mark this with a Sharpie pen or a ballpoint pen or any kind of a marking tool that will become permanent in, in your quilt. On your practice piece, let's just try some uh, basic quilting designs. Let's try stippling. Remember, you don't want to cross your lines over. You just want to create a nice, even background. When you get the hang of that, be sure that you work on getting your stitches all the same length. Just kind of drag it around. Try doing some loops. Try loops in different sizes. That's a really fun background feel. And also loops hooked to things like loops hooked to hearts. Uh, loops hooked to stars. And maybe loops and, and uh, petals. Those always look good together. And loops and some flowers. Loops are good ways to, to connect things together. And you want, might, might want to try uh, doing hearts and stars going different directions on a pencil and paper because your brain doesn't know if you're working on a quilt or if you're working on pencil and paper. So um, when I'm sitting in meetings or whatever, I try practicing all these designs going different directions. Okay, and then just practice some more stippling and some more loops and shells. While we're practicing doing stitches, let's practice a little bit with the thread tension. I like to go off to the edge of my quilt and bring my bobbin thread up and my bobbin thread is white and my top thread is a dark brown so I can see the good contrast. And I've tested this um, just doing the rest of this quilting here and I know that it's, the stitch is great but let's try loosening this half a turn and let's see what happens to that tension. <laughs> okay, we'll lift up the edge and Looks like we got a few little dark pokies in there, but that's not too bad. Let's turn another half a turn or more. Let's see what happens. Whenever I change the tension, I change the design. So here's a look at this. This is worse. This has got pokies that are coming through from the top. It's a dark brown. So we know that we need to turn that tension up. So we need to righty tidy lefty loosey. It even broke my thread, so I'll have to re-thread it. So now let's try tightening the 
knob here and see if we can get that tension a little bit better on the back. Probably quarter inch, uh, I mean quarter of a turn or a half turn at a time is all you need to try. Let's see what that looks like. Ah, it's pretty balanced. Looks good. Um, there's little holes here, but there's no thread coming through them. It's just a hole. The thread has filled it, so we've got a good stitch. I'll show you, let's try a really, let's do a one and a half revolutions and see what happens. See, it's starting to pull, the bobbins pulling tight, and the top, which is a dark brown, is getting thrown down down underneath the quilt, so you're getting loops, big loops here, major problems. So let's turn it back up. And so just kind of play with your tensions. Just put the top thread and the bottom thread in contrasting colors and just get to know that, that tension knob. I found that even, even if I have the same brand of thread that I'm using on a quilt, maybe I'm using three or, different, three or four different colors of the same brand, Sometimes just changing the colors makes a difference in my tension. Uh, not usually, but sometimes it does. So just be sure you check them. The HQ16 has an accessory. It's a large base that just simply clips onto the base of the machine. And it helps so that when you do ruler work, the rulers have a nice large base to work from so there's no teetering or wiggling of the rulers. All you have to do to attach the base is just fold it. It's made of a flexible Lexon plastic. Fold it and just drop it in over the pegs that are on the side of the machine. Now we're ready to go. I keep my rulers off to the side of my quilter where they're easy to get. And this is just an accessory box that you can get extra to go with your quilting machine, but it's just a handy place to store your, your rulers. Um, this ruler is a quarter of an inch thick and it's just perfect to go along the edge of the foot of the machine. The lines in the ruler tell you exactly how far you're sewing from the needle. Uh, right along the edge is exactly a quarter of an inch. And of course, it goes in quarter inch increments, so you can go half inch, three quarters of an inch out from the edge of this ruler to get nice, perfect stitching. So let's see, let's start over here in the black, and I'll show you how this works. When the do a couple of stitches and tell that needle to end needle down position. And with this base on here, I have lots of room to hold down on my ruler and keep it nice and steady and drag the machine against the edge of this ruler so I have a nice perfect line. It's almost impossible to make diagonal lines on any quilting machine that has wheels because they're working on an X and Y axis and the X and Y start to fight. Uh, each other and you get kind of little wiggly lines. Now I'm going to back this ruler off about a quarter of an inch from that intersection because I know that the distance from my needle to the outside edge of that foot is a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to go right down here, stop right in that point and I'm going to tell my machine to always end needle down. Okay, once again I'm going to put my needle down Put my ruler a quarter of an inch from that cut edge. Stitch, hands needle down. And I'm going to stop right in the middle of that. And I might have to just probably sneak around this and let's go needle down again and continue on over here. So just about as fast as you can move your ruler, you can get nice, perfect lines. And then when you want to come back, it's just the reverse. We'll start down here. Let's tell like we've got this whole row finished. And you just go back the other direction. Get nice, pretty cross hatching, nice X's. Ruler work. It's for nice, tidy work. 
Now there's other accessories. You can get circles. It's hard to, to ever make a complete uh, circle that's large that's perfectly even and straight. Sometimes you can stencil them on and they get pretty straight, but these uh, you can do half circles. Let's put a half circle down here. And we have some crosshatch lines and okay, we'll do a couple of tight stitches. Lock our stitches down. It always ends needle down. Clip my threads, put my ruler back. And then you just get this exactly where you want it. Hang on. I'm going to lock my stitches. And if I wanted to, I could um, go over to the middle of my design and quilt a whole different section, um, another ring inside of this one. I put down another size ring so I can do the inside. And I have some double half circles and they're perfectly straight and there's no wiggles in there. Now I'm going to do a little bit of freehand work in here. It's okay to do ruler work and freehand in the same quilt. That finished that up, and I didn't have to use any rulers. As you can see, it's a lot faster to do free form work than it is to do the rulers, but you have to have the rulers on some, some things. Now I can see as I'm working that the quilting is starting to draw the quilt in, and I do not want my quilt to be hourglassed, so I'm going to do a basting stitch down the side here. I can go a little bit faster if I want to. However, fast you feel comfortable doing that, but now I've basted that down. It's going to force the quilt to stay square. And once again, I've, I've basted right in that outside edge so that my binding will cover it up and I won't have to unpick it. Before we start our pantographs, we need to connect our laser stylus. Be sure that you connect the laser to the post before you connect any power to it. We want to have everything safe. Tighten it up. Remember the laser points down this direction. Plug the post into the back of the pod here. And just make sure that you're safe with this laser. You don't want this to get in your eyes or your pet's eyes or children or anyone else in the room. You want to keep this a safe thing to use. So just keep it pointing down and unplug it when you're not using it. Now let's go to the front. And the easiest way to do that is to unplug the laser. We want to keep it safe. Loosen the screw, slide it off the post, and then move the laser to the front of the machine. And it's unplugged so we don't have to worry about hurting anyone. Tighten it up. Be sure that that laser is pointed straight down. Tighten it up and take the cord underneath the thread and back into the laser. Pot, laser connector in the back of the pod and you can see the laser right here and now we're ready to go. Remember to put your cord guide on, screwed onto your carriage. Be sure you put a loop in and it's big enough so that when you move the machine back and forth it doesn't catch or cause any drag to your machine. Let's talk about pantographs. 
A pantograph is something that you use with a stylus of some kind. And in this instance, we're using a laser light. And the laser light will follow a pattern, somewhat like this pattern. This is a continuous line design. It's um, easy to follow from beginning to end. There's no stops and starts. This is a commercially made pattern. This is a Harry Walner pattern. This is her garden delight. I really like this pattern. I um, enlarge and reduce it a lot uh, for different sizes. In fact, this one is enlarged from its original pattern. I also use clip art and coloring books. Those are my friends, too. A um, few things that you need to be aware of when you decide what size is you need to, to lay the pattern on the quilt and look at, it, look at it and see what it's going to do. Lay the pattern in the block and decide where you think about center is and make sure that all the way around this outside edge from the edge of the drawn line to your stitching line or your seam line that you have a minimum of one half inch. If you have less than a half inch and what happens is this starts getting in pretty close to that stitching line and your eye starts picking up the deviation and the difference between these two lines that they're not exactly perfect because they never will be exactly perfect because we're dealing with cloth and it has a tendency to move. So a half inch makes it so that it always looks tidy and finished and looks like it's always equal distance from the edges. The other thing you need to do is with a water erase pen uh, you can Put your crosshatch line in here, just a big X, so that you can find, find dead center. And with the water erase pen, you can come into this area and draw the same line. A nice blue, or you can use the purple air erase pens, because this line's going to have to come out. This is just a plotting point. So what we want to do is have this center match up with this center, so that this design is exactly in the middle of this square. And the way we do that is place a stiff table, kind of a surface. I have a piece of plexiglass here. You can use a piece of wood. Sometimes I use the back of my clipboard. Something that creates a nice flat table because you've got to make this design flat and even if it's not, if it's curled up or there's any lifting, that design and that lifting will transfer over into your quilting. So I've, I've got this on my board. I have drawn an X in the middle of this, this design from point to point so I can find dead center. And over on my quilt, I've done the exact same thing. I've taken a water erase pen and I've drawn from corner to corner an X. So that I have center in the middle of my block too. So that means I want to make the center of my block on my quilt and the center of my paper block, my design, match up exactly. So I'm going to drop my needle into the center of my quilt and I'm going to come over here to my my little miniature table here and make this laser light find center. So both of these are centered now. The, the machine is centered and the laser had, has found center of my paper pattern. Now I'm going to make sure that it's not skewed this way by taking the needle out of my quilt and I'm going to maybe go three quarters of the way down the line, drop my, my needle again, and make sure that that laser is exactly on that line. Then I'm going to put a piece of tape out on the paper. I'm going to lift up my needle and just follow my quilt, follow that line on my quilt, and also look over here on my paper. And yep, it's still straight. I haven't got it twisted. So I'm going to put another piece of tape on that and I'll check the other direction. The other direction should automatically fall into line because we've got the other points that have proven that they're in the correct place. So I've got a bit of lifting right here so I'm going to tape this down and I'm ready to start quilting. Step four, I need to see, decide where I want to stop and start quilting on this because I can't tell you how many times I've done one of these designs and forgot where I stopped and then re-quilted over an area that I've already quilted. So I've made a, a dot right up here in this corner and that's where I'm going to start my quilt and I'm going to stop my quilting. Uh, you can stop or start in any of these points wherever it is. Just remember or mark it that that's where you're going to start and stop. Okay, my laser light is up in this corner. I'm going to drop my needle and I'm going to secure my stitches, make sure that I have those locked in really good 
and I'm going to trim my threads. If you don't trim your threads, you're over here watching this. Pretty soon your threads are wound around your foot and you can't move, so it's a good idea to start trimming. Um, I usually stitch between 65 and 75 on these pantograph designs. You've got to get going at a pretty good clip so you have nice, smooth lines. Okay, I'm going to pause in my points. Pause. I'm going to swing the machine. Pause. Swing the machine. Pause. I want to have nice, even, fluid lines here. I don't want to have slow, jerky, drawn-looking lines. I want them to be smooth. And if every once in a while you go out of the lines, it's okay. It shouldn't be that accurate that you have to have the laser exactly on that line. Okay, I'm going to pause and pause. Nice, smooth lines. And we're into the home stretch here. And there's my design. It's finished. It's evenly placed all the way around the edges. It's centered because I took the time to position my pattern and my quilt. A few tips on using your laser light. Uh, you loosen it at the top here and it moves in different directions. Be sure that this doesn't get in your eye or anybody on the floor and pets, children. Make sure that you're, you treat that laser with some respect and safety. Let me show you some things that happen. Notice that when I quilted this, I had this in pretty close proximity to the quilt. If I move this clear out here, which I could do, that, that could be done, but look what happens to that laser light. <clears throat> it starts turning into an ellipse you start losing your accuracy too because it starts telescoping your pattern. You start getting it longer at one end and it's shorter at this end. It starts turning it more into a, a trapezoid instead of a square. So try to keep this laser so it's looking down as much as you possibly can onto your pattern. Keep it as close to your design. And when you decide where you, where you want it, just tighten up the screw. When you're finished with the with your laser light, be sure that you reach around to the back and unplug it, and that disables the light. And then you're ready to go on to do other freeform quilting or other designs. To use the laser on the back of the quilter is pretty much the same as the front. I've moved my laser from the front of my machine back to the back post. I've plugged it in so I have light. You can see the laser light's working. And to position the pattern is pretty much the same way as when we did the the pattern from the front of the machine. We just laid it on the quilt and decided where we wanted this positioned. Now one thing that you need to remember when you're working on the outside borders of the quilt is, is that you've got a binding. So you don't want to have your design fall underneath of your binding. So if you need to offset that to whatever it needs to be, be sure you keep that in mind. Also, the same half inch principle still applies to this edge. And I'm, I've cut my pattern so this outside edge is my plumb line. So I'll take some pins and I'm going to um, put some plotting points in here because I'm not able to make a big X or anything like that. So these pins will be like the center of my X. They'll be my plotting points. And I just put a few along the edge there and I put another pin right where that pin's coming out. You can see as the pin's trying to pull out of here, I'm going to put another pin down in that hole so I can see where that plot point is when I pull the pattern away. Another one here, and I have another one here. Now in my pattern, I have little tiny holes that you can't see. But those little holes that the pin left, I'm going to carefully go through here with my pen and mark those, those same holes. Here's another one here. And I'm going to use those for my plotting points. Now all I need to do is put the pattern on the table. And as you, you can tell, this is a pattern that was a short eight and a half by 11 paper. And I cut it up and taped all of them together so I have a nice long continuous line here 
and going to take out this first pin and put my needle down, needle down right in that hole where that first pin is. Okay, and that is matching up with my first point that I've colored in here. And now I'm going to put a little piece of tape down to stabilize it right where that pinhole is. My, my next line is right here. So I'm going to move the machine down to the next pin, get right in there where the pin is sunk down into the quilt. Okay, I'll move this up and adjust it where it needs to be. Tape it down again. And I'll continue this process all the way down to the end of my quilt. When I've got all my plot points figured out, notice I'm taking these pins out. I don't want to take a chance of running over them when I get doing my pantograph. Okay, there's my next plotting point. Uh, so I'll continue this all the way down to the end. And I'll back it up. Pick up my last pin here. And I can start in any point that I want on my pattern, and I can start quilting from, from the um, right to the left on the back of the machine. When you're on the front of the machine, it's left to right. But if you quilt from right to left on the back of the machine and left to right as you're working from the front of the machine, that's the direction that the hook and the thread likes to go the best. You won't have any problems with breaking thread. Any quilter company recognize that it takes training and practice to become a proficient machine quilter. So to help you, we've developed a series of videos to teach you the best techniques of machine quilting. We've chosen wonderful instructors from across the country to share their techniques. And we know you're going to have fun with your HQ16 because it's built to quilt. Happy quilting. <laughs>